And so this is me, I'm William Blackstock, Chair at Eastern Oncology, been there at Wake Forest for a while. I did most of my training at UNC as a resident and a fellow, um, and uh, now really has been you know, involved with the Conference of Cancer Center, was program director for six or seven years. I uh, have an interest very much in gastric cancer. This is a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I, I knew Debbie Zellman, so this to me is my shout out to Debbie's family. Um, I was awarded, I forget the year, I was trying to look it up on the internet real quick, what year I won the Tree of Life, which is the award that the, the Debbie Dreams Foundation gives out, and I was very pleased to receive that, and that was a big deal for me. Uh, but I do miss Debbie. I'm certainly, everybody who's ever met Debbie will, will miss Debbie. I want to tell Mary Margaret, I'm sorry I'm a little bit late. Guess what, there was a little rain on the way in today. Um, so this is a challenging talk, so now we're going to start the talk. Um, because I want to be able to speak to the folks who are lay folks. I really, and I have targeted this talk toward that group. But I also wanted to have a little data, a little information for those folks who probably have read a lot and who know a lot and have gone through the experience of this. So I do have some data slides, just a couple, but that's just to give it a, a bit of a, a scientific flavor. But I'm going to tell folks, and I hope I see you in the back, if you want to get a cup of coffee at the first part of this talk, it's really just about how radiation works. And you, you already know how radiation works. Um, but I want to do that. Radiation oncology tends to be a bit of a mystery. You hear about chemotherapy, and I think some people, you know, well, my mom had, you know, not my mom personally, but mom had breast cancer, so I sort of know what that was, or dad had lung cancer, I sort of know what the chemotherapy piece of it is. Clearly, you know, the surgeon, you know, one day took my dad to the operating room and he came back with less lung, so you sort of know how the surgery works. Um, the radiation is a bit of a mystery, and I like to sort of calm people's fears, because a lot of times when I'm doing a consult on patients, the very few first 10 minutes is really just explaining what it's going to be like, because if you haven't really been near it, it's just this, it's just, it's just, to me it can be a very scary sounding thing. So here's the first part, and then the second part's a little bit more data, and I see Jordan is in the room. I think maybe later in the morning we'll have a little more data. I don't know, I don't, I haven't so you've seen your presentations, but it'll probably be a little more data driven. And if there's any radiation issues that comes up in those studies that Jordan or Hope talk about, I'll be around to, to address that. So here we go. Maybe not. Oh, there we go. So what is the challenge for radiation oncologists in treating a patient with, with gastric cancer? And it really is the anatomy. So as you look at these slides, and I, I got a pointer here somewhere, I bet. This is, a, this is the stomach. This is the proximal end. So your esophagus is here. You're coming through. And this is the distal end. And you're going into the small bowel. What I'm trying to display with this slide is really the lymphatics are extensive in the stomach. And when a surgeon goes in and surgically takes out a stomach that has cancer in it, the, really the question for radiation oncology is, do you need radiation after that surgery? Or if you can reverse it, do you need radiation before that surgery? Uh, and if you're going to direct the radiotherapy, where do you direct it? What areas are at risk? Clearly, if you're doing radiation, and usually when I say radiation, I mean radiation chemotherapy before the surgery, you've got a scan that's showing you where the tumor is. You can see the abnormal lymph nodes. Targeting is pretty easy, but even then you still have to make sure you're covering the drainage areas that are at risk. So while the scan may say, well, okay, these are the abnormal lymph nodes, but here's, here's the other lymph nodes that are at risk that you should cover to make sure you don't miss any disease. So this really is sort of my first introduction to you guys of, well, well what's the challenge of, of radiation? And that's knowing what the lymphatic drainage, hope I'm making sense. So if it's a proximal stomach cancer, the lymphatic drainage, drainage is very different the lymph nodes at risk are very different than if somebody comes in and, and again, I'm going to the post-op setting where the surgeon says he or she that I resected the distal stomach and here's the stage, which means usually how much tumor was in the stomach uh, and how much lymph nodes were involved. But the lymphatic coverage that a radiation oncologist has to do after surgery is very different from here for a tumor here than a tumor here. I hope that made sense. So this is a very crude radiation portal. We are a little more sophisticated. Actually, we're a lot more sophisticated. Um, radiation involves beams coming from multiple angles. We use very high technology devices to sort of direct the beam. Um, and again, I'm not trying to be insulting at all, but I sort of kept this as a very simple portrayal. Oops, can I go back one? I sort of kept this as a simple portrayal because I wanted this to, again, to describe to you what the, the challenges are. So if you look at this carefully, and it's a little bit hard to see, 
you can see there's a bit of a purple box that's sort of outlined in an area. And again, this is a very simple portrayal of what radiation fields look like. They don't look this simple at all. But we then have to respect, okay, so here's the lymph nodes for the celiac, or here are the lymph nodes for the splenic hilum. But when folks ask me, and this is an important comment, people, what, what do you know what the dose is? Why for stomach gastric cancer patients is 25 treatments? Uh, is that the magic dose that means you're going to fix everything? That has really very little to do with it. The limiting issues around radiation oncology are really what's around you. And if you can see, and this is why the stomach and gastric makes it very difficult, pancreas treat, treatments are very difficult. So if you see the yellow organs, that's the kidneys. That's both kidneys. There's a lot of liver in this field. I don't think I really outlined the liver. I've just sort of given a general small bowel. So guess what those things don't like? They don't like radiation. If you give a dose to a kidney that's way below the dose you would like to give to a tumor, it's almost a third of the dose I'd like to deliver to the tumor, but if I give a third of that dose to an entire kidney, that kidney dies. So the last thing I need is for Alex's dad to come back to see me three years later and say I'm doing well, or six years later and say I'm doing very well, but my medical, my medical team tells me my, my kidneys are starting to have issues. Could that be you, Blackstock? And the answer would be, if I've treated too much kidney, the answer is yes. Uh, so again, I'm trying to put some context to it. I'm not driven by what dose I want to give, because sometimes I'd want to give a lot more dose of radiation, but it's really just making sure uh, Alex is dead. I'm sorry, Alex, I'm going to do that all through this talk. Doesn't come back from a hospital stay of three weeks because he had a small bowel perforation because I gave too much radiation to the small bowel. Does that make sense a little bit? Okay. Oh, I'm having a little trouble. Where should I point it? There we go. Again, this is describing really mu pretty much the same things. Um, again, 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 I'm sort of re re reiterating, but you've got the duodenum, which doesn't like radiotherapy. But this will be a radiation portal, and I should have outlined this better for you. But the prior image was from a proximal stomach. This actually is from a, a distal stomach cancer. And you can see that this field doesn't look like the last field. The residents in my training program referred to this as the Texas field. So for most distal cancers, you really have to cover these lymphatics. Again, very different lymphatics, splenic hyalum, porter pattis. Again, you've got these kidney issues that you're having to deal with. Um, but this is a very different sort of strategy than the strategy for what you would try to do for a patient who's got a proximal gastric cancer. Press it hard. I'm pressing it hard. All right, so now we're gonna to start to talk about a little bit of data. This is a study that really has, and, 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 and Jordan and, and Dr. Shaw and, and Hope may just update me a little bit, but I really still, this reflects standard of care in this country. There's sort of two different groups. There's a European group, and I'll leave that to Jordan. He'll probably cover that, or Hope will cover that. But for this country, the role of radiation is, was really defined in this study, which has got some age on it now. This is probably over 10 years old. But we really didn't know what was the best strategy in this country and where radiation oncology fit in for patients with gastric cancer. Again, this is a bit of a dated trial. Uh, but for patients who come in with gastric cancers who have had a surgery, so they've already, had, they've already seen their surgeon, the question then comes up, what do you do next? And in this study, we basically decided if you had surgery alone, you had your surgery, you go home, well, what happens if you add chemotherapy and radiation after the surgery? So this was a randomized study of over 500 patients. Some received surgery alone. Some received radiation plus chemotherapy following their surgery. And the arm of the study that actually improved was those patients who actually received their surgery and chemotherapy. If you look at the box, the blue box below, overall survival was very much improved for those folks receiving surgery and chemotherapy or chemoradiation. Uh, versus those folks who see who only saw surgery alone, and the progression-free survival was actually very much improved. So the bottom line in this country, this established the standard of care. Let me tell you about a few caveats. This study was done for folks who had already had their surgeries, so this was not an opportunity to talk about what we could have done before the surgery. And there's some European data that would say chemotherapy with followed by surgery and more chemotherapy, and I hope you may ch you may chat about that, is also a, an, an effective strategy. But in this country, a lot of gastric surgeries were taking place out in the community, 
and you never had the opportunity to look at really giving folks chemotherapy before. And I think that's shifting. I think the European experience is sort of, it's flavored us that, that surgeons bring, bring patients in to see us in multidisciplinary settings where we can talk about them before they have their surgery. But to me, when a patient presents to me right now who's had surgery, and again, it depends on the stage. Obviously, if it's very early stage and all the prognostic factors are good, I don't treat those folks. But if they come in with lymph nodes that are positive, et cetera, then this to me reflects the standard of care. I would argue that you should be very careful when you see your radiation oncologist to make sure they understand uh, that this is a not a very common disease. It's not rare, but it's not very common. And what we learned from this study also was this was centrally reviewed radiation review. So let me see if I can say that again. When a patient came in who was going on this trial, because they received a cycle or two of chemotherapy, the radiation planning was done ahead of time, but you could review it. You sent it in centrally. So I would see a patient. I would do the radiation plan. I would send it in to Cork, which is in Rhode Island. I had the time because they were getting chemotherapy. And then the cork review would come back and say, your radiation portals, your radiation doses, everything looks fine. Or they would say, it doesn't look fine. Here's some things you need to do to change it. And in this study, over half of the patients, when they had their cork review, had to have major changes made to the radiation fields. And that really told our discipline that we really probably didn't have a good handle on what areas we needed to treat and what the limitations were on radiation. It woke us up a little bit. So I think the system, you know, things have gotten better, uh, but but you do want to make sure that as you talk to your radiation oncologist that they are sort of aware, uh, you know, do you treat one gastric cancer patient a year with radiation or do you treat 15 or 20? I think it makes a difference. Um, and the lymphatics are very, very different, as I've stated also. So you really sort of need to know where you're aiming to be if you're going to be treating a gastric cancer patient. So moving forward. So I hope you may cover the European pre-op chemo versus post-op chemo, or should I mention it up here now? Well, I don't have a slide, but I was just going to say I would never fault any strategy that involves a European approach to this, which is really to give the chemotherapy preoperatively, get some response if you can, do the surgery, and give those folks post-operative chemotherapy. And that clinical setting radiation really doesn't fit in. There may be some situations and nuances where it does, but in general, we don't fit into that. So I just want to make sure for those out there who's, who may have questions, well, my, my dad or my mom didn't get that. Well, they got what I just described. It's, it's fine. So where are we going? This is a study that's trying to bring in Herceptin, again, hoping, and, and um, Jordan may talk about this a little bit. But we learned from people like um, Debbie that Herceptin is a major player for those folks who have HER2 overexpression. Uh, HER2 is something that only 20% of gastric cancers express, but if you're in that 20 or so percent that express Herceptin, HER2, you really respond very well uh, to trastuzumab, uh, which is a Herceptin therapy. So, but this is a study that moved beyond that. The original data was in patients who had metastatic disease, stage four disease, who really weren't gonna get radiation. And as you can imagine, we then said, if that works in that clinical setting of advanced stage four patients, how's it work in folks who really have less disease but they're locally advanced. So this was a study that's trying to integrate radiation into a trial of oxaline and cape zatabine, which are very typical chemotherapy, but also with Herceptin. So that was novel. This study is actually closed to my knowledge. I did search today. These guys in the room may tell me it's actually been published somewhere. I couldn't find the result. But I, well, I did find the result. I apologize. The next study's not been published. And what we did learn from this study is essentially this was doable and feasible. The study was not large enough to actually say if there was, it was efficacious or there were advantages to it, but clearly this is something that should continue to be pursued because it was feasible, patients tolerated it well. So I apologize. We did learn the result of this study, and that was this should be continued, we should continue to look, look at this strategy. Maybe Hope can press it harder than I can. I'll tell you, I'm pressing as hard as I can. All right. This is a study that's just completed enrollment, if I'm not mistaken. This is a U.S. experience where we we're doing, doing the same strategy, right? We're trying to bring Herceptin, uh, HER2 overexpressions into the stage three setting, not the stage four setting. And this, again, is really a straightforward study of radiation, chemotherapy, plus or minus uh, trastuzumab or, or Herceptin. The study was open in 2010, as you can see. I think it's actually closed a bit early. I'm not surprised it closed early. A lot of folks are very excited about this. Uh, I think the only frown I would have on this, and Jordan, I'm going to put it on you because you've got time to prepare your slides by this afternoon. I hope he tells me that there's some additional drugs along the line of Herceptins and biologics that we're, we're starting to look at. 
because to me, this was a home run for those 20, well, it, it has been a bit of a home run for those folks with, who overexpressed HER2, her but unfortunately only 20 or so percent of patients that overexpress HER2, so you still got 80% of patients who were treating like we treated them back in the 1990s, and that's unfortunate. That should be my last slide, so as I press hard, okay. So I'm gonna finish up by saying, um, you know, it's a pleasure to treat cancer patients. You know, when patients come to see us, they don't come to see us because they're having some issues with their diabetes or their hypertension. They're, they're coming to us oftentimes because they unfortunately realize they've got something that's trying to kill them. And so when I have a patient put their trust in that I'm gonna go with you and your plan, that's an absolute privilege. And I'm finished. Do I stay for questions or is it later? Okay. Do we have any questions for Dr. Blackstock? Well, we actually did have one sent in with registration. Uh, what, um, what is the difference in response for radiation when the cancer metastasizes to different organs? Is that approached differently? Uh, that's approached differently. You know, once we treat a patient whose disease has already started to spread, the medical oncologist really takes, takes control of that environment because we don't have very little, we have very little to offer. There may be a few clinical settings where I'm sorry, I know these folks personally, we've, we've known each other for years, but if Hope and, and Jordan said, well, I've got a patient who's had distant deposits, uh, but they only had two or three distant deposits, there is some ideas now to start looking at a big old word, it's called oligometastatic radiation for folks with limited volume disease. I wouldn't have done that 10 years ago and would have just screamed at a resident who even implied they could do that, but the technology in radiation oncology now allows us to treat metastatic sites which are typically are small. I mean, I don't want to get into that too much because there's, there's always the parameters of what you can do. But if Jordan or Hope had sent me a patient who had one liver met metastasis, and after they received chemotherapy and they were doing very well, 10 years ago, I'd have said, what are you calling me for? But if Jordan or Hope called me and said, William, this is 10 years out and they're doing really well, would you be interested in radiating that one spot? Absolutely. Because we are starting to see people live longer with this disease. I, did, I left that out. Folks are living you know, a lot longer than they used to live. And when I was a young man, which wasn't a thousand years ago, as my residents like to, like to think, we didn't do that very often. So to me, to have a patient get tied up with radiation was probably not a good idea. But the techniques and technologies now allow me to treat a metastatic deposit in less than a week. So I don't feel like I'm wasting Mr. Leonard's time by treating a spot. Uh, and I think there's some data coming out in other disease sites, not gastric, that say oligometastatic, again, that big word, radiation makes some sense. It certainly makes sense in lung cancer. There's some data says that it makes sense in prostate cancer. It's not been studied in gastric cancer yet, but I think it's inevitable. But in general, once, it, once the disease metastasizes, I'm out of the, I'm on the sidelines, which is where I should be. Don't give, him, don't give Jordan the microphone. Okay. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to know, um, my understanding is 10, 20 years ago, stomach cancer was an old people's disease. And now I'm seeing <coughs> younger and younger people, sorry guys, <laughs> younger and younger adults hit with this. Do you treat differently based on age? I know that's not politically correct, but that's the bottom line. Do you treat? Do you radiate somebody in their 40s differently than you would in their 60s or 80s with this disease? So I, I think I can answer that in a way that will be, be helpful to you. I have to look at the demographics, and again, you've got people who probably can answer that better than I can. You may be right about the shift toward the younger patients, but I, I suspect there's plenty of room that could tell us exactly what that is. My struggle, and again, you've, you've touched a, you've got to keep me on time, because that's a question in radiation oncology we've not done a good job of. The surgeons have real defined endpoints in terms of when they can do a big operation, whether it's a gastric resection or a Whipple, which is a big operation for pancreas. They have this geriatric assessment, and I think that word's okay still, where they can say, okay, a patient that's this age with these comorbidities and these illnesses, what's the likelihood I'm gonna do something that's gonna really set them back? Medical oncology really was the first folks to develop that sort of geriatric assessment because they were worried, well, would it, why would I not give an 85-year-old chemotherapy because they're 85? They may be 85, but they may be biologically 65, because that, you know, they, 65 is the new 85, or eight, I got that backwards, I think, but um, we haven't done that very well in radiation oncology, so the honest answer is, is an unsatisfactory answer, 
For me, it's the eyeball test. You know, I'm looking at you and I'm thinking, you know, you're in a wheelchair, you're on oxygen, and radiation and chemo can be pretty, can be hard on you, I can't, I can't say it's not. But I do have now a surgeon who says to me, they're able to take the surgery. I mean, once a surgeon has gotten a patient through a surgery, they've probably already decided that geriatric assessment, if you will. So I have the benefit of that. They've already come to me with their surgery, which tells me they're going to probably tolerate I did pretty well. I see the surgeons in, in the room. If he or she got them through the operation, I can get them through radiation. <laughs> That's probably unfair to say. Um, but we, we're all thinking more like we don't really need to tell patients who are a certain age they can't get the standard of care. It really depends on the patient. Mom's 84, and she looks wonderful. So, William, I was, and by the way, his name's written as Arthur, but he's William. Um, <laughs> William, uh, I was gassed. I do it on purpose in case somebody says, Arthur was a horrible speaker. <laughs> yes, he, yes, he was. <laughs> oh, sorry. It was William. Say, it, say the truth. The, um, the, the uh, uh, question I was going to ask you is one that comes into my clinic all the time, but is better answered by you. And that's, there's a lot of stuff on the internet about things like proton beams and gamma knife and, oh. and cyber <laughs> knife. And... As far as I know, there's not really a huge difference between them, but they are different. And, and I think a lot of people like to know what, what this all is and how much of this is hype versus, you know, just another form of radiation. He knows me. He knows he's going to set me off with that question, but I'm going to still keep it brief. Um, and just in case you don't know, it's public because they have to do a public declare. We have no proton facility in North Carolina. But UNC and Duke have now filed CON, Certificate of Needs, to build proton facilities. They're going to build them within 20 miles of each other. Um, I'm not certain the state needs more than one, and I'm pretty sure they don't need two that are 20 miles apart. Um, and the price on these, it's public. I'm not divulging anything. It's a public document. Uh, one institution is spending $88 million on their facility, and the other facilities, the other institution is spending $38 million on theirs. And of course, my leadership said to me, we gotta get into business, we gotta have a proton, we can't not let those guys outshine us. And I said, so we're gonna throw whatever million dollars we're at a proton facility, and that's gonna end up with three proton facilities all underutilized and losing money fast. Half of, most, half of proton facilities that go live go bankrupt because you can't make up that kind of money because there's not enough patients who need it. Does that make sense a little bit? Yeah, let me do that with you. So there's, there's different, 99%, you got you to gotta, you gotta put the ring on this, I mean, hook me a minute, because I can't go along. But 99% of what we do in radiation oncology is photons. That's what everybody does. Everybody does it. Duke does it, UNC does it, we do it. The community guys, that's what, the, that, the machine is a photon machine. And then some folks thought that protons, which is another particle, would have some advantages. And it does have some advantages in terms of how it deposits the radiation dose. I would love to talk to you at the break about that. That's a physics discussion, and it's kind of hard. But I'm, I'm, everybody understands that those symmetry around protons has advantages over photons. But you have to sort of select which patients in which that matters. And in which that matters to me right now, and I hope I'm answering your question, Jordan, it probably matters in pediatrics because you really want to make sure with a kid that you know where the dose is going and where the dose is not going because the long-term ramifications of an eight-year-old being radiated is tremendous. And actually in radiation oncology, we do everything we possibly can to avoid radiation in a kid because we know the good news is you're 20 years old now from being eight, but there's some things you're dealing with, some serious things you're dealing with from the radiation. So protons make sense there, but the randomized studies that have looked at protons versus standard photons are starting to fall apart. Now, if I could turn the mics off, I know I can't. I would turn it off at this moment because you said, well, why would anybody want to invest in something that really only has an indication in a handful of patients? There's still some other chordomas. I mean, I could give you a list of things, but these are small these are not a lot of patients. 88 million bucks for really just a handful of patients doesn't make sense financially. So the initial strategy when people started doing this, and I'm going to have to go public because it's not, it's true, was money. We, we're going to charge folks, Blue Cross Blue Shield, five to ten times what we're going to charge for photons, and we're going to tell them it's better, and we're going to make a lot of money. Well, then what Blue Cross and some of these folks did was what they should have done. They said, well, show us data. Show me where it helps. Show me where it's better. Show me where it's, where, what am I spending my five times what I would normally spend? What am I getting for it? And unfortunately, the Proton folks have just not been able to do that. So now the reimbursement's doing this. Actually, it's doing this. So that's what's driving Protons. And originally, it was really how much money can we make? And now I think you're going to see people starting to pull back. Half of them go bankrupt. Um, and so... The advantages of protons for gastric cancer have never been shown. That's to get back on target. 
There's no data that suggests that photons don't treat gastric cancer patients just as well as protons. And I guess my first few slides about the anatomy, what you really like to do with protons is really target things where you want to be a really, you know, really focused, really narrow. But when you're treating lymph nodes in the stomach, and that, you know, it's a big field in my world, what I showed you guys. There's no advantages to protons when the field's that big. There's just no way. But if you're treating a small tumor in a pediatric patient, and you're trying to avoid all the good stuff around that one small tumor, it makes perfect sense. But that's not most of the world. Most of the world are photons. Does that help a little bit? So if you have a referral to see a proton person, ask them to show you the data. Where did, where, what, what gastric studies have been done that says protons is better in terms of outcome? I would think it would be very difficult for them to show you anything at all. Uh, I'm not trying to say these folks, because UNC and Duke are fabulous institutions, and I really think their goal was to say, we want to provide North Carolina with a proton facility. I'm actually engaged in a conversation with UNC to see if I can participate in their proton facility, because I do see kids and I do see that handful of patients that I'm sending out of the state because I think for those handfuls, they need protons. I'm happy we've got a proton facility to come in North Carolina. I really am. We needed one for that, for that pot. Do we need three? You know, my leadership said, so how many million are we going to spend to be a bunny losing third proton facility? Doesn't make sense. Does that make sense? I have no problem sending kids to chapel to get protons. I would, I welcome that. Okay. Thank you so much for All that. Right. And we have time for maybe one quick answer that's just maybe kind of piggybacks off of that. So what is the future of radiation oncology? I got that one for you. So um, I'm very fortunate, and Jordan and I were inducted into ASCO's FASTRO, and I'm on the board of directors for ASCO, and I'm on NCI thing, which is kind of a, I'm a pretty modest guy, but the gray hair got me something. So I'm on some, some pretty nice spots to make some differences around cancer. And the radiation oncology specifically is biomarkers. The medical oncologists have really run with that. You know, you can get a, you probably, for those involved in medicine, not a week goes by that you don't see a new drug approved for something in medical oncology. A new MAB or NIB or whatever, immunotherapy, you can't even keep up with it. And it's because these guys have said, okay, we're going to subselect. It's like Herceptin in gastric cancer. We're not going to try to find a drug that treats everybody with gastric cancer. We're going to try to find a drug or immunotherapy that treats the 20% who are going to respond. We've got a biomarker that says it's a really high chance you're gonna, this drug's gonna work in you, and those drugs are getting approved left and right. We haven't done that radiation oncology, and that's my sort of spout when I go to ASCO and when I go to NCI is, we've gotta start looking at biomarkers for radiation. I would love to have told, I don't know if you, Mr. Leonard got radiation, but if I could look at a panel of biomarkers and said to him, we now know after looking at all the biomarkers and genomics and all that stuff, you're really not going to get much out of the radiation. So let's just get that out of your life. Let's avoid that side effect of that toxicity. On the other hand, I guess I'd like to turn it to the positive. You know, again, I'm sorry I'm doing this Alex Dad thing, but you know, we've looked at your biomarkers and you are the perfect person for radiation. And while there may be some side effects, we know we, we're going to help you with this. And even then you want to fine tune it. Your radiation dose might not be this much because you're so likely to respond. Your radiation dose may be not five weeks, but three weeks or two weeks. That's where we've not done work and I'm really an advocate for that, and I think it's going to have to happen. Otherwise, we're going to fall further behind, you know, Jordan Berlin, which I can't have that. Um, <laughs> does that answer a little bit? That's my one personal thing, though. I mean, the field is exploding everywhere, but my one personal thing is biomarkers. 